Vincent Van Gogh paints himself free of self-pity. It does not occur to him to complain. No matter what he endures, no matter what anguish and penury and isolation he suffers, he does not feel sorry for himself in his self-portraits. This seems counterintuitive. Vincent, as we intimately call him, is surely the most round and downtrodden painter in art. A long soul struggling to sing like a bird while the brutes shoot him down. A misunderstood genius, excluded and eventually suicided, as Antoine Artaud said, by society. The passion of his painting. Equates somewhat in our minds with the missionary passion of his life. He is ill, but he cares for others. He is poor, and yet takes the indigent into his home. He preaches a message of hope through the whole of his life without ever being given a reason to hope. He fails as a preacher. His zeal unheeded. He feels in the art trade, just as we feel a spirit so high above commerce should. Unrequited in love, unrecognized as an artist, not a single painting sold in his lifetime. As legend has it, he was locked up by public petition as not fit for the liberty of the streets. At his lowest. At his lowest point, desperate for brotherhood, abandoned by the treacherous Gauguin, he finally shoots himself in a field where the black crows call, unable to walk any more through the shadow of depression. Of all painters, Van Gogh is the nearest to martyrdom and the furthest from ego. The one we should most like to protect, and the one we would most readily embrace if he chose to limit his、uh, lot, but he never does. Van Gogh is not stretched. Van Gogh is not wretched in his art, and he is not a martyr. There may be melancholy and a look of aftershock in the self-portraits from time to time. But he keeps the agonies to himself in the endeavor to make strong paintings. This strength is visible and probably uplifting, yet it has not prevented generations of viewers from believing that they experience his、uh, sufferings when they look at his works, that they can hear the fine high notes of Vincent's grief. In that sense. There seem among the most unexamined and misunderstood of all self-portraits, as if people could not see them clearly because blinded by their own fellow feeling. Consider self self-portrait with a bandaged ear, generally thought to show Van Gogh in his most harrowed. The very little. Speaks of an injury and of a Vincent's notoriously, notoriously self-inflicted injury. The severing of his ear lobe during the fateful visit of a Gauguin to the Yellow House in Ars. In that title, the whole of Vincent's tragedy is expressed. But the title is not his. He did not give the self-portrait titles; they came later, and on a way rare occasions when he writes of them to his brother, Theo. The descriptions are terse: three-quarter lens on a light background, dark violet blue, and the head whitish with yellow hair. So it has a color effect, a color effect. What a understatement! Self-portrait with a bandaged ear certainly has a color effect. It paints the arsenical arsen- green of the overcoat, buttoned against the cold, and the aqueous green of the eyes, brilliant 
as the sea surrounding an iceberg, against the yellow walls of the house in Arles. Yellow, wrote Van Gogh, is the color of hope, and so it always seems in his art. He may be bandaged, but to see him in his familiar bedroom, opposite the window and the bed and the rush-seated chair, with the walls glowing encouragingly behind him, is to know that whatever else he is feeling. Van Gogh is at the very least at home. He has all his possessions around him: the easel in the background, bearing a work in its early stages; the Japanese print pinned to the wall; its pale Mount Fuji, a tiny circumflex echoing the dark triangle for Van Gogh's body, and the lighter triangle of his face. The fur-trimmed hat, with its curious pro of brushy furs, protecting his head against the cold. It is a congested scene, all hemmed in except for the opening on the right, which, like a stage winds, implies another place to go and gives, moreover, unto daylight. Van Gogh must have painted the picture in January 1889, his final role with Gauguin, apparently triggered by a disagreement over Rembrandt, whose、uh, work they had admired in Montpellier, on the same trip where they saw Bourgeois Monsieur Colbert, took place on Christmas Eve 1888. As is well known, Van Gogh had. Severed a part of his ear in a wild fever, and took it as a gift to a girl he had seen in a bar. He was in hospital for some time, and then lovingly cared for at home by the redoubtable postman Rollin. At the time of the painting, before the dressings were finally removed in late January. He is writing almost daily to Theo, not just about Rembrandt and his own aspirations for art, but about the serenity he aims to achieve. Everything ran against this. His landlord was trying to have him thrown out of the yellow house. The local police were keeping a close watch. There was no money, and Gauguin, who had long since departed, kept pestering him. For the return of certain possessions, and for a painting of sunflowers, he insisted he had been promised. Van Gogh was a frail, undernourished, chronically insomnic, and tormented by nightmares whenever he did manage to sleep. But still, and still, he continues to paint. To those who see him as a holy man of art, the Van Gogh of this self-portrait is displaying stigma, stigmata, brutally shaven with his martyr's wound. He freezes in the January cold, every brush mark raw with horror. He had come to Arley to follow the light, find the way and the life, hoping to gather around him. A band of like-minded brothers, but the only one who had come had already deserted him. Yet he must go on, on towards the truth, painting even when hungry and ill, even when flayed. Doctor Gauch, the physician who looked after Van Gogh so tenderly in his final days, was the first to use the term, the words "love of art." Gauch wrote. Are、uh, scarcely applicable to him. One ought to say, "Believe unto martyrdom." But the paintings are their own evidence. In self-portrait with bandaged ear, the brush marks are slower than usual, carefully laid, as if trying to keep the picture steady. There are no words and striations, no speeding vectors, and. The bandage is not sacramental. 
no matter how we might cherish the legend of the Holy Year. It's just there as part of the scene, a matter of fact, like the coat or the hat, not something that magically transforms the meaning of the picture. A picture that is extraordinarily still, moreover, the storm having passed, the wreckage having been repaired, the incident is not forgotten. Van Gogh could have chosen not to paint himself with a bandage, just as he could have painted himself unbandaged, hacked and bleeding like the expressionists who venerated his work. But Van Gogh has achieved a degree of a pictorial composer. Perhaps it was a hard one. The eyes betray a long and very relationship with the mirror. But the face is not so much herald as a stoic and strange to, it, to itself in convalescence. This is a dignified and austere self-portrait. Its mood swings confined to form and color. It is not a martyrdom. It is not true that Van Gogh never sold a work. A young Scotsman he met in Paris bought a picture directly from him, a basket of apples, surging like a plucky craft, sur- surging like a plucky raft on a sea of brush strokes. So exuberant, the canvas is practically overflowing, overflowing. Joy in all things. Van Gogh received nothing more than the price of the fruit, but some bitter consolation can be found in the fact that the buyer's horrified father stupidly disposed of the picture for five pounds not many months later. Early collectors often lost their nerve. In 1893, three years after Van Gogh's suicide, the British consul in Amsterdam bought what must be the wildest painting of a cross ta scenes in all art, a bizarre portrait, no other word will do, of the two raging red crabs thrashing against the tight green ground as if protesting their freedom. Stranger than Saltwater Dali's lobster tele- telephone, it still looks staggeringly avant-garde today, and it is just as well the console died soon after selling it for a mere eight dollars, eight pounds, escaping inevitable remorse, for it soon changed hands for a small fortune and entered the National Gallery in London. Unlucky in life, Van Gogh was blessed in death to have his uh, reputation cherished by a uh, extraordinary woman, his sister-in-law, Jo Bunger, who inherited his uh, estate upon Theo's premature death only six months after his brother. Bunger seems to have had a keen sense of uh, the future and of the way Van Gogh's fortune would turn. She sent his uh, paintings to exhibitions all over Europe instead of uh, simply handing them in her grave to a dealer. She also refused to allow the publication of his uh, incomparably eloquent letters to Theo before the paintings were well established, realizing that the tragedy of his life might overshadow the art. It would have been unfair towards the deceased artist, she wrote in the preface to the first edition in 1914. To awaken an interest in his person before his work, to which he dedicated his life, was recognized and adequately appreciated. French collectors bought sunflowers and the starry, starry skies. The Dutch bought the southern sun of a province. A London stockbroker had the wit to collect the dark, and the knotted drawings of uh, peasants made when Van Gogh was teaching himself to draw with do-it-yourself manuals in his father's house. 
these exceptional images with their bent and humbled figures, their delicate wintry branches, so much like、uh, Hiroshige's cherry trees, show how early and swiftly Van Gogh absorbed the lessons of Japanese air art. It's a mere few years to the blazing glory of the irises and sunflowers, for Van Gogh is one of the shortest careers in art, not more than a decade from beginning to end. But the self-portraits only arrive in the last five years, and were not the first of his pictures to find fame. John Bunger Bunger's instincts about the letters. Protected the self-portraits, at least in the early twentieth century, from being valued less as art than as relics. In 1885, returning to his father's parsonage after several failed careers, Van Gogh paints himself with eyes red and swollen, but piercingly vital. In Paris, two years later. He shows more of himself, dressed like an urban dandy. He holds a pipe, smokes a pipe, shows himself with pipe and beer glass in the unconvincing manner of a corbar. Corbar. He claps his、uh, palate like a、uh, Rembrandt, whose work he is studying in the Louvre. You can see the influence he absorbs by the season in the self-portraits, from Rembrandt to Courbet, Millet, and Monet. In early, during the Gauguin's nine-week stay, he even painted himself flattened and rugged as a Gauguin. Yet, no matter how much he venerated the work of other artists. His mannerisms are indelibly his own. The vectoring heavens, the unfurling spirals and worlds, the aurid, the aurid suns and the starlight halos, the crisp flakes of sunlight seen through dark leaves, the pigment almost unmixed from the tube, the pressure of the brush from. A brush firm on the resistant canvas, the unmistakable mark. Van Gogh's signature is in every stroke. He never needed to sign a painting, and the self-portraits keep pace with each new phase of his art. Van Gogh is a pale ghost against a dark ground, very nearly art deco. Ah.、Uh, Oh, his head is as explosive as a sunflower. In one self-portrait, the face is almost entirely green, the green of a summer sky, apart from the bright glint on the forehead, and then the sudden flaming of hair. In another, the eyes are cobbled against a salmon pink ground. A inversion of a cherry blossom against the bright spring sky. His face is like a wind-flurried wheat field, or a curlicued pattern of a tendrils. There is a self-portrait where a ear has the intricate origami folds of a iris, and another where the dark eyes are fringed. With bright lashes like a sunflower. What impressions me most, much much more than all the rest of my work, is the portrait, the modern portrait. Van Gogh is writing during the Paris years, and unable to pay for models, resorts to his own face. His aim is to be more truthful than the academic conventions of.、Uh, Portraiture have ever been, and he will get there with his、uh, color effect. He said, instead of trying to reproduce exactly what I have before my eyes, I use color arbitrarily to express myself falsely. Around this time, he made a self-portrait with a felt hat, a painting composed of、uh, short, sharp lines, like. 
exclamation marks without the dots, each laid quite visibly, one to the next. One image one imagines him tilting sideways to work his way up the collar, round the head, into the eye sockets. The marks, a continuous radiation that reaches its culmination in a vibrant hollow around his head. Wang Gao was coming to the end of his time in the city, and his、uh, spirits were failing. Wang left Paris seriously sick at heart and in body, nearly、uh, alcoholic because of my rising fury at my strength failing me. Then I shut myself up within myself," he said. "Yet the painting communicates neither weakness nor failure, as one might expect. Let's say from a more conventional Vindersil self-portrait, you cannot look at it without being intensely aware of its singular idiom, of the way the hand must have held the brush. And the press is a fright of paint over and again on the spongy canvas, of the rose madder, and the ultramarine and the burnt amber and the violet that build up the figure against its ground. Standing before it in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, you feel held in a force field, the source of which is not in the facial expression or the Palpable intensity of the eyes, but in the working of the surface itself. It does not seem an exaggeration to speak the aura of Van Gogh's painting. In the self-portraits that follow, the marks are like a hyphenation, most cold, war paint or tribal markings. The whorls in the background resemble the dizzying morphology. Of migraines, moist brush marks elongate around the neck or arms and turn dry and staccato among the close alleys of the face. How hard it must have been to navigate the human countenance with this evolving system of notations, striations, spirals, and minims. So much more easily applied to furrowed fields, or the wallpaper behind the postman's wife, and yet Van Gogh strives on, never letting himself off, making no exception for his own face. And though the rhythm flows relatively easily through clothes and hair, and even nostrils, the whole structure of the eye defies him. In self-portrait with a felt hat, the pupils are eventually described simply as dark circles, as if the pioneering of this new way of painting reached its limits at this deepest of points. It is difficult to know yourself," he wrote to Theo during the last months at the asylum of Saint Remy, "but it isn't easy to paint yourself either." Those who want to find and perhaps protect the hollowed soul in Van Gogh's self-portraits are generally those who find madness there too. But the conviction that his marks are indices of a neurosis, if not full-blown insanity, is slowly beginning to weaken. Van Gogh did not paint, could not paint, in the grip of the paranoia or depression that. Spiritually assailed him, lucidity and calm. He writes constantly to of the calmness of his art were absolutely necessary, and without them, he would have been a quite ordinary painter. Between these、uh, bouts of paranoia and、uh, depression, he tells Theo he must take advantage of every moment, and not strictly speaking mad. For my mind is absolutely normal in the intervals, but during the attacks it is terrible, and then I lose consciousness of everything. But that spurs me on to work and to seriousness, as a miner who.
who is always in danger, makes haste in what he does. There is no disorder in the letters. They are lucid to the end. The one found in his、uh, jacket, when he shot himself, is as ever concerned for Theo, encouraging him not to downgrade himself as a simple dealer in corrod, but to consider the part he has played in the actual paintings of others. And observing with devastating clarity that he is in a considerable crisis, his own reason, half foundered in the making of art, but the handwriting holds steady somehow in the service of communicating reassurance and news to Theo, unlike the nearly illegible, illegible scratching. In the last letters of his contemporary Nietzsche, which in their every word and mark expresses a mind vanishing into the tunnel of insanity, there is a, a self-portrait in which Van Gogh is visible losing his grasp, his grasp of the lexicon of Marx. It was made at Saint Remy in late August, eighteen eighty-nine. And one has a sense of some kind of a neurological failure, of the mind trying to, failing to transmit its stream of commands to the hand, or of the hand being the wrong hand, struggling to do just as, its brother has always done so well. Indeed, the hand holding the palette, in this slowed and stalled painting, is itself a utterly. Shrunken invalid, but if there is less physical dexterity, there is no loss of intellectual strength. The man is still here in the art, and it makes the fortitude exceptionally poignant. This is not the last self-portrait, no matter how fun- funeral the black background or emaciated the pale face. Any more than cross over the wheat field is Van Gogh's last painting. We take it to be so because it's a apocalyptic energy, and the beauty seems to be a fitting feel, fitting herald of death, as much as the dark harbingers hovering over the field. But the scholars have shown that the marvelously controlled. The Bignes Garden, beginning with its plot of vivid arches and rising to its distant church steeple, is more likely to be the final work. And just as the last letter is not a suicide note, so what seems to be the final self-portrait does not speak of last things, though it does stand. As a tremendous summation of all he hoped to achieve with the modern portrait, dazzling and yet solemn, it is the painting of a man resolute in infirmity, sure in dilemma, upright in a sea of brilliant blue worlds. He stands within a starry night in daytime, as if there were no world except that of his painting. The song of the color is strong. The movement of lines radically idiomatic, yet nonetheless perfectly descriptive, of the crack of the cheekbones, the eyebrow sinking within the folds of the frown, the red beard stark as ever. Van Gogh talks of himself as he talks of sunlight and fir trees in exactly. The same language. He is of a piece with his painting. It has been said that in some picture, it hardly matters whether the subject is a bedroom or a pair of old boots. Van Gogh's style is so powerful, so overwhelmingly utmost, that he might as well be painting one of his own paintings. But the counter argument is here in this very. Late self-portrait, so sane and unself-pitying, so triumphant over life's miseries, where the style represents the man 
we suppose is channel and source. Van Gogh never explained exactly how he hoped his color effects would act upon others, but the strange outcome of so much radiance here is a kind of an uplifting quietude. In the music of Marx, calmness was what he sought in his art and achieved in this、uh, tremendous self-portrait.、Uh, this is the first part. I stop here.、Um, it's a great to read uh, this uh, paragraph, uh, which is、uh, in the book "A Face to the World" by Laura Kami on self-portraits. It is a great book that I enjoyed so much, and、uh, it is good to read it again.